Welcome, everyone. It's my great pleasure to be the moderator for tonight's um, talk with Joanna Keen Lopez. As someone who's spent a lifetime thinking about and studying earth and architecture, I thought I would introduce the talk by giving everyone in the audience a little bit of context, theoretical context and historical context to what I think uh, exists in the landscape and has existed, and it, perhaps a way to connect that to Joanna's work. Um, so on the 40th anniversary of the Smithsonian Magazine's, uh, uh, on the, sorry, on the 40th anniversary of the Smithsonian Magazine, they announced the 40 things you need to know about the next 40 years. And what was surprising to me about that was that the number one thing on that list was that sophisticated buildings will be made out of mud. And I thought the number one thing that you need to know about the last 10,000 years <laughs> is that sophisticated buildings were made out of mud. And so I want to give you a little bit of sense of that history. Um, some of you may not know what adobe is because I think in New Mexico, the word adobe means many things. It can mean a style, the way a building looks. And we think about how Santa Fe is an adobe city, in fact, but it's also the style of adobe. But adobe is made out of the land itself mixed with water and straw to make bricks that are dried in the sun. And on this planet has made incredible buildings, 10 and 11 story buildings, for example, that create the first cities on this planet, made out of mud in the city of Shibam in Yemen, for example. And in the 1980s, the UN did a survey and they found that one half of the world's population, approximately three billion people on six continents, lives, works, or worships in buildings constructed of earth. And there's a map that was created. I think there's a slight mistake when it dips up into southern Colorado there in the center, the location. But the, uh, on every continent, except for one, we can find people living in buildings made out of earth. Sometimes we think about this earth as buildings that are old and in ruin, like these necropolises in Egypt or buildings you see in the landscape in New Mexico. But in fact, it's very much a living tradition on this planet. Uh, granaries, agricultural buildings, and it's also a sculptural building material. And you see how in mosques in Janae, for example, the weathering that takes place over time and the application of mud by hand transforms the building to become much more like the body. And it's also a form of craft, ways of thinking about making a building that keeps much of the building in shade, for example, also an example of a school in Mali that stays cool during the summer and celebrates this relationship between the body and the land and the making of architectural form and space. It's also a practice that involves the community and communities all over the world participate in the making of buildings made out of earth, um, not only in Africa, uh, but also here in New Mexico, traditionally. It's also a practice in which the pigments found in the earth can be highly ornamental, as we see in practices in Ghana, for example, in India, or the beautiful applications of earthen pigments and organic pigments, biological pigments from plants and animals um, are applied to the earth's surface. It's not only a building material of rural environments, but also urban environments. And we see over the years, perhaps the last 10,000 years or the 200 years ago to that point, we see how modernity has begun to transform these buildings. The introduction of plumbing, for example, or electricity into earthen buildings or, or uh, television uh, or satellite TV or Christmas lights in this building in, uh, near El Paso, Texas. And even here in New Mexico, we see how not only the introduction of technology, but the introduction of new cultures has transformed the earth building environment. And also there's a way of thinking about earth where some materials remain and some have left the traditions. For example, this building that uses powdered milk cans in lieu of adobe bricks, or here in New Mexico where we see tires in lieu of adobe bricks. We see how the buildings transform over time. San Lorenzo and Picuris Pueblo, uh, in an image probably not so dissimilar to how when it was built in the 1700s. And the advent of the railroad uh, and sawmills transformed the building with, into having a pitched roof, lime plaster. And we see how romantic ideas of what the building may have been or is has transformed the building to what it is today. And I sort of believe that 
during the 40s and 50s when many of the population of the small villages in New Mexico left to work in factories or bigger cities, they took these churches with them in the form of lowriders, which took them to the places that they would work. And we also see here in New Mexico how different kind of vehicles emerged from the transformation of the culture. The demand for adobe bricks as more and more people move to New Mexico in the Southwest and are interested in earth building across the world create adobe yards where vehicles drive over the landscape consuming the earth and producing adobes in their wake. And we see how artists are beginning to interpret these changes in technology and culture over time, like the artist Rose Simpson who refers to Maria Martinez's work in the making of a vehicle that learns from the clay traditions of the landscape. And so this is a, this is a common transformation, Casa Grande in Arizona, efforts to preserve the building, and even more sophisticated efforts to preserve the building that transform the building into something entirely new, I think, a hybrid kind of architecture. And we see that architecture continue its tradition in the context of modern architecture, where earth is used in some really fantastic ways, thinking about the pigments, the landscape, the history and tradition, the, the craft and the handmade, technology and the kinds of languages that come with that. And not only the kinds of languages that are shaped by, let's say, southwestern languages, for example, of an old west storefront, but the adobe is also political material and communicate political ideas, the difference between wealth and poverty in a landscape. For example, in this project Pratamarfa by the artist Elm Green and Dragset, which I had the privilege to be the architect for. But we also see this movement emerging in the art world. Uh, Earth Room in Soho in downtown Manhattan, where the landscape returns to the city within uh, an urban building. Or the artist Andy Goldsworthy, for example, who uses local clays and wool from sheep to simply cover a surface of the wall where we see time plays a factor in transforming the landscape into something else. The artist Rafa Sparsa, who uses adobe particularly, to think about adobe as a canvas and applying paint to that canvas to communicate ideas that are political, that are involved in the social practice of making the work. Um, and so I think all of these things are embedded within the work of Joanna Keen Lopez. And I'm excited that she will begin to share that work with you tonight, because I think if there's uh, one thing that you need to know about right now is that sophisticated art is being made out of mud. Thank you, Ronald. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you for being here. And um, my exhibition at Site Santa Fe is Landcraft Theater, and I'm excited to tell you the story behind it. Uh, so I'm from Albuquerque. I was born and raised there, um, but my, my father's family, um, the Lopez side, um, is from Socorro, New Mexico, where we have an old land grant there called Lopezville. And it's been in the family since about the late 1700s. Um, and it's at this point, it's abandoned. Um, there's quite a few old adobes that are there that were from my great-great-grandparents. And um, you can see how the original buildings were built out of adobe. And then from there, it was cinder block and adobe. And then from there, it was um, wood. Um, just a uh, frame, uh, frame wood, and then from there it's like trailers, and so it's like a further and further progression away from land-based working with land, and as um, as a connection with um, relating to your own landscape, and then also what Adobe architecture really like asks for is um, is family and community to come together and make these adobe homes because uh, it, it requires many hands. Um, and so a big part of why I've come to this practice is partially me trying to reconnect with this, um, this like relationship with land-based practices that goes back to my family and also this fragmentation that's occurred um, through 
through, it could be multi-generational trauma or, or families moving away, and now these homes are completely abandoned. And one thing that Adobe really needs is, is maintenance, and it requires, it requires um, reciprocal care and um, sustained relationships to continue that care. And so for my practice, I'm really thinking about creative ways of working with this material. Um, going forward, and also how to continue um, creating relationships through this material. And so this is an image of one of the houses that my father recently gave me. Um, it was built by one of my great-grandfather, Abelino. And it was just adobe, and then my father decided to start putting river rocks on it. Um, and it's very, I don't know if you know the term rasquache, but it's, it's this term thinking about using what is uh, the available materials that are just there in the environment. And so thinking about this mud, it's just right from the area. And then my father just went down to the river and started, um, I'm actually going to show this one, just went down to the river and started putting a bunch of rocks on it. Um, yeah, his name's Damasio, and actually a couple of friends came from there. Um, on my mother's side, um, I'm Irish, actually, and this is a house in Ireland um, that was my great-great-grandmother's, and it was built out of peat and thatched roof. And so on both sides of my family, there's this um, relationships to home and land and using the materials that are just right there. And so this is definitely a big part of why I think I've come to this practice and thinking about the landscape and then how that works with architecture and um, home. So this is another image of the house in Lopezville that my father gave me. This is the one across the street. Um, that was my great-great-grandfather's and it's abandoned and it's it's um, you know, it has a lot of stories in it. So we actually lost it um, because a lot of the, the uh, property has been foreclosed on. And so it's like this interesting thing for me. And it's not very unique. You know, there's a lot of um, new people in New Mexico who have these old homes that belong to their family. And now, you know, people have moved away or died or in prison. And, and um, now they're just kind of sitting there abandoned. And so that's been something I've been sort of like a seeking towards bringing back those stories. This is the landscape in, in um, Lopezville. And so thinking about that, I have, since my early 20s, um, started studying um, natural dyes. And um, so this is chamisa that just grows a lot um, along the highway. And I took, a, I took a workshop in Tierra Maria. It was maybe when I was like 21 or something. Um, and just to learn about what it means to do natural dyes. And this was with um, the Manzanares family that lives up there. And so it was really amazing to go up there and, and learn not just about this material, you know, but also these relationships in this community and these like passing down of this, this, um, this method. So here's cooking the chamisa. Um, also learning about like uh, cochineal and how that works. Cochineal is an insect that nests on the, uh, the prickly pear, the nopales cactus. And it makes this red color. So indigo. And so from there I started um, experimenting with different types of dyes. This is onion skin and cochineal and thinking about fabric. And I also started to think at this point about paper and how that would relate to paper as well. And so in my exhibition here at Landcraft Theater, I have some very large paper wire sculptures that are dyed with botanical dyes, including cochineal and chamisa and indigo. Um, and so this is some of the, the test strips. Um, and so from there, I started thinking about large, I've always been really interested in large scale installation and home and materials. So this was um, an exhibition I did called Oda La Fuente, um, which means Ode, Ode to Source. And it's made out of paper and wire and paper mache. And um, those are all dyed with the different types of dyes that I was mentioning just now, including prickly pear. And yeah, and this is when I first got into um, making adobe bricks. 
You can see a little bit right there. I actually found, the first time I ever started working with Adobe Bricks was I went on Craigslist and there was a post and the, there was a guy who was giving them away from an old home in Old Town, Albuquerque. And he gave them to me and he told me all these stories about, about you know, his house and his home and how it was just had it dilapidated. And, and I took them home and I reconsolidated them and made my own um, wooden form. And when I was taking apart these old adobe bricks to make them anew, inside of them were these old newspaper clippings and old like, like rolling tobacco papers that were from like the 20s or something. And for me, I grew up in Old Town in, in the South Valley in Albuquerque. And so it felt like this like archeological like, ex like, like finding and like ghosts from the past. And so that was, that was in this project. Um, so in my exhibition at, here at Landcraft Theater, I revisited um, these, these materials with the paper and dyes. And it's very organic. And so thinking about like land and sky and like kind of these theatrics of, of the landscape and then how to like translate that to sculpture and large scale installation. This one's with walnut hole and the cochineal and um, the chamisa. This one is um, with the indigo. Um, this is uh, maybe from about six years ago when I was experimenting with combining paper mache and wire. And that is um, paper with the cochineal, but then the brown is actually a, it's actually mud. It's um, called a lease. And it's a clay slip paint that you use on the interior of um, adobe walls. And so I painted that onto this paper. And I learned these processes um, from studying with women in northern New Mexico, um, from Anita Rodriguez. And um, she's an amazing enjaradora and painter. And enjaradora comes from the, the Spanish verb enjarar, which means to mud plaster. So um, enjaradora is like a mud plasterous. Um, and so I guess traditionally it was like men who kind of put the adobes down and then women would do a lot of the mudding, the enjare. Um, and it's like the beautification of the adobe home and like a very artistic aspect. And that's one of the things I love about adobe architecture is it's, it's not just like a construction practice, it really is an artistic practice in relationship to, your, to the land. And beyond being a material, it builds relationships. And so for me, I, I studied with Anita, and she's amazing, you should check out her, her work, um, her paintings. This is her um, straining it. And so this is actually called um, caliche, it's like kind of like a very, um, like very clay rich, whiter, creamier color. And um, how it works is you, you strain it and then you add buttermilk, is how she showed me. And the buttermilk is, acts as an adhesive. You can also add mica so it can like glitter on the walls. And so this is when I was, this was about nine or maybe eight years ago. This is um, a picture of Anita learning from um, an, another enjaradora from, from Taos. And, and Anita is actually from Taos, New Mexico, I should mention that. And so this is her learning from from someone else as well. Um, I also studied with Carol Cruz, and she's um, from Taos, New Mexico as well. She's a natural builder and an artist, and um, I should mention that both Anita and Carol um, had their own businesses with, with mud plastering for like, tw like 20 plus years. So Anita ran a construction company called Enjaradora, and then Carol also had a mud plastering business that she did. Um, and they're just amazing. This is actually Carol Cruz's book, uh, Clay Culture. And she focuses on a lot of pl mud plaster and, and paints and um, pigments. And I'm still really great friends with Carol and, and um, Anita, and they're just wonderful. So just as like being a very young woman and, and learning from them, it was, it's really inspiring and um, just to see they both built their own homes and just, it was really, I was just so, I, was, I just still love them and they were, they were great um, catalysts. And this is some of the materials, so thinking about, oh, okay, there's mud, right? Um, but then there's all these tools that you work with and what kind of tools those are um, and how to, how to work with them. And so 
It's definitely a craft. Um, with both of them, I helped to mud um, some of the churches in northern New Mexico. So this is the Rancho de Taos Church, and then helped with like the Truchas Church as well, and thinking as well further with like how mud is not just a material, but it is like a vehicle for making relationships and sustaining relationships. And um, this is when I first started making adobe bricks. Um, maybe after that time, I got the one from the Craigslist post. This is from a friend of mine, Ruben Elgin, and um, we made like little ones in Bernalillo. Um, yeah, so I'm gonna go ahead and move into some of my work that I've been doing with Adobe architecture as large scale installation and sculpture. This was a project that I did recently, this last year actually, in San Antonio at Blue Star Contemporary. And um, I built this with um, a couple other people. It really requires multiple hands. It's not a material for one person. And throughout all of these projects that I've done, I, I'm usually at the gallery or the museum or the space like getting to know people. I've gotten to know people here at site really well. And so it's, it goes further than just people who are helping um, me directly. It's like uh, just being in a space for a while with, this, with installation work. Um, and so with this project I included, I was thinking about like a half moon um, the back is exposed and the front is mudded. And then I have um, all of the clays are actually clays that were collected. So except for the one in the, the blue one, but all of the other ones were gifted to me and they're colored clays. It's not amazing, the yellow one, and they're from like, uh, like Terra Lingua in Texas and Ojinaga um, up in southern Colorado and northern New Mexico. Uh, my friend Sandros Canovas, who is an adobero in, in uh, Marfa, Texas, gifted some of these to me. And Scott, I forget his last name. Yeah, oh. okay, the Pigment Hunter. <laughs> yeah, he, he, so they were all gifted. It was really amazing. And I actually offered, I was like, I'll give you guys some, you know, and they, they, were, they were like, you know, you can't sell this, you know, like they found it, you know. Um, and so this was a really amazing experiment to work with, like, uh, it's this about seven foot tall with um, this type of material, but then thinking further like, oh wow, they, there's so many different colors of, of clay that you can work with. And um, think about this as like a, a canvas as well in painting. Um, so this is another angle from there. And those are some Adobe bricks that I mud plastered and then painted as well. So it was, this was called the um, Adobe Color Factory. No, the Adobe Color Laboratory. <laughs> and inside of there was, um, I don't have it in here, but there was uh, different tools that I used that were hung on the wall and then like a map of where all the, the clays come from. And um, yeah, and the entire space was used as like a little laboratory, which actually here in site was pretty similar. Um, this is another work that I did for the National Hispanic Cultural Center Art Museum. Um, and then I used fabric, cotton, and then dyed it with cochineal and onion skins, and then was working with mirror and lime wash, mica, and adobe. And so just thinking about how these materials can come together. This one was for the Crystal Bridges Museum of American Art for the State of the Art exhibition that happened in 2020. And um, this with blue mirror and, and yellow mirror, and then this the Elise that I actually collected with Anita. Um, and there was going to be a performance where we were going to be bringing out New Mexican performers. The concept of this was Resolana. Um, Resolana is a, a, like a New Mexican term for a sunny side of a wall where people come together to to um, share and and. Um, just yeah kind of come together as a community and so thinking beyond like a wall separating people it's like a wall that like brings people together so that was a the concept of this from um continuing off of an earlier project that i'll get to so we were going to bring performers out but um COVID actually happened just two weeks after the opening or three weeks after the opening so um yeah and this is another one that i actually this is actually my first adobe sculpture that i did and it was um a through a grant through New Mexico Arts, Art in Public Places, and this was in Edgewood, New Mexico. It was in front of a police station and an animal shelter. Mm 
So I kind of got into this first through like public art and through grants and have been moving further and further towards like large scale installation for like, for like um, Site Santa Fe and other museums. So this is what the back of that one looks like. Yeah, um, and I, bu I built this uh, with uh, my friend Jose, and so it was just me and him, and I was just really figuring it out. And it was funny, because I didn't really learn how to build with Adobe, um, like construction. I was taught by Anita and Carol specifically how to do plastering. Um, and so I've had it along the way where I'll be building and then some viejito, like some older man will come along and be like, oh, this is really cool, like, and ask Jose, like, what are you doing here? And he's like, it's this little ladies. And, um, but he'll be like, well, you're putting the Adobe bricks, like, the wrong side up, you know, because there's actually a right way to put the Adobe bricks, the concave down, way down. So, and I'd be like, I had no idea. And so along the way, I've actually had people come up and be like, what are you doing here? And then be like, well, this is actually, you know, so along the way, I've had people kind of be teaching me. And I think I got a hang of it now. Um, this is a, a project I did for the Harwood Art Center um, in Albuquerque. They, it's also a Montessori school. Um, so this one was quite large. Yeah, and this one was with a, um, a lime wash that I mixed with a pigment. Um, this one uh, was for a, um, a fulcrum fund through the Andy Warhol Foundation for the visual arts, and it was about performance and public art and gathering. And so I, um, I hosted, this project wasn't so much about, it was about the, um, the sculpture, but it really was about bringing people in, specifically different women who are performers, to um, kind of activate the space and to create an event. Um, and so that was really, um, really a lovely um, project that I had that I really found that I very much enjoyed organizing and bringing people together and seeing other people like learn. And I actually, um, when I built this, I had friends just randomly who were interested come and help build. So it was very much like a very collaborative experience during the building and after. And so um, this is another image. So wait, I had one friend who came um, from Marfa and she did a, um, I don't even know how to describe it. I guess it's like shadow puppetry and then singing. So she projected imagery onto the sculpture, which was really beautiful. Um, and so from there, I um, the last, since last year, I think, I have been teaching workshops on how to work with Adobe architecture and mud plastering in Albuquerque, New Mexico, uh, with um, Helen Levine from New Mexico Earth Adobes, which she um, she runs she co she co runs um, one of the last Adobe yards in New Mexico. There's two left. The other one um, is near Española and is run by Mel Medina, um, but. Helen's father started this Adobe yard in Albuquerque in the 70s. And I became really good friends with her and we started these workshops. And um, so here's another, another image of it. And um, we've been doing about eight to 12 people and people come and we teach how to do making Adobe bricks and the right type of consistency for like sand and clay. Um, and construction methods of how to lay adobes and how to do work with the mud mortar and keeping things level and plumb and then also how to make adobe arches because there's there's so many beautiful ways that you can like sometimes people are like oh it's just a wall but it's like you can really do so many sculptural elements of it and so so they, i've been really enjoying teaching this um for this uh, exhibition here at um, site, I also created a product called Adobecitos, which is um, kind of a, it's a miniature kit, a do-it-yourself kit. And um, I was really thinking about how Adobe architecture is, it's very laborious, it's, it's a lot of work, and I wanted to make it very really accessible for other people who might want to understand, might want to get a sense of the material, um, 
but want it in just a smaller way. And so in, in the, um, in other besitos, there's 30 adobe bricks, and there's also a bag of dirt and a palita, so it's like a little trowel, so you can actually build, build um, whatever you want with them. <laughs> mm -hmm. They're right here in the site curated store. Um, I can't really read this very well. Okay, this is the instructions. There's a glossary put together, thinking about vocabulary with this practice. Read, I'm sure, closer. do you want I'll, to? I'll read some of the words in the glossary. Uh, adobe, which is a sun-dried brick made of mud and straw. Adobero, a person who makes adobes. Alice, a clay slip uh, painted on interior walls. Uh, chante, which is a small mud home. Uh, enjarradora, which is a person who mud plasters, a woman who mud plasters. Enjarre, which is the mud plaster itself. An horno, which is an adobe oven. Uh, palita, which is the small shovel or trowel and soquete, a word for mud that comes from Nahuatl. Yeah, and so I wanted the, the adobecitos not to just be like a fun um, box full of adobe and the do little adobes and dirt, but also like an educational um, opportunity. Um, there's also a, um, I tried to, I wanted to put it in a historical context for people as well to, to have. I don't know if I should read it or it's You want me to read that? Sure, yeah. <clears throat> Okay, my eyes are as bad, but... Uh, <laughs> so the back of this box says, Adobe had been in use by indigenous peoples in the Americas, in the Southwest United States, Mesoamerica, and the Andes for thousands of years, and for thousands of years. In New Mexico, Puebloan people built the structures using adobe placed by hand until the Spanish introduced wooden forms for making bricks to the region, a technology which uh, traveled to Spain from North Africa. Adobe is among the oldest building materials known to civilization and is used throughout the world. The makers of Adobecito honor the tradition, traditional knowledge of their ancestors that connect to land and craft. Thank you, Ron. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so... Um, when I was, this, these are, this is a sketch that I started making when I was getting ready for Landcraft Theater for the, the Adobe um, architecture part. And it's really important to understand how you're going to cut the bricks and lay the bricks. And it's very, um, you got to plan ahead about that. <laughs> you need to know how many bricks you're going to have and everything. So um, there's an, another sketch that I did when I was thinking about the original idea. And I was really interested with this exhibition to be thinking about how do I kind of bring together different types of materials and surfaces and textures and to kind of show like the rawness of the adobe as well as like thinking about it as when one painting almost, like it's one um, canvas. And so I also hosted a workshop here when I was building these with 10 people who, um, some of them came from like Tucson and LA and Austin. And so it was really wonderful. And they all came and we, um, we built these in two days, actually. So and it's just always so amazing to have people come and see what, you know, what kind of stories they come with or what, you know, and see what they end up doing with some of this work as well. I think at this point, I've actually maybe taught at least 100 people in workshops. I think it's almost there. <laughs> and yeah, just started, yeah, I haven't been doing the workshops very long, but um, it's been very rewarding. This is the work that I have in Landcraft Theater. And um, yeah, I, I mean, it's a project that is many hands and it comes from relationships. And I just really can't stress it enough. Like when I really started working with Adobe Architecture and Adobe as a medium as an artist, it goes beyond just a medium. It's relationships, it's community building, it's, um, it, it's really changed my life in, in a big way um, because people change your life and relationships are, are so intrinsic to everything. And so I, 
I'm just really interested in thinking about architecture and thinking about land and large-scale installation and social practice through teaching and bringing other people in or performance. Um, and then thinking about painting as well. Um, and, and exploring how this medium can really can really be seen um, through the lens of sculpture. Yeah, and I guess to bring it back, um, I think for myself with um, thinking about my family and like the Lopezville and thinking about these abandoned places or, you know, even the one um, for my mom's um, family in Ireland, that house doesn't exist anymore. Like the people aren't there any longer. And even at Lopezville, it's just all abandoned and falling apart and the family's mostly gone. And, and um, you know, and through this, through thinking about some of these materials, it's like, I really feel like it's kind of me in a new, another generation thinking about these creative new ways to continue this practice and this material and to like renew creating new communities and relationships. So yeah, I think that is, uh, that brings it together. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> well, I, I'd like to ask Joanna some questions myself and start a conversation and then invite everyone in the audience to join in that conversation if you have any questions. I mean, what, what struck me about this work from the very first slides is something related to the work itself, and particularly that Joanna is working with uh, pigments that come from the natural landscape. Uh, and some of those pigments come from plants and, and insects and biological pigments, and some of them come from uh, the land itself, the mountains, geological pigments. And I couldn't help but think about the photograph of her great-grandmother's house and of her great-grandfather's house, and the fact that her great-grandmother's house in Ireland is made of peat, which is a biological material uh, from peat bogs, and a roof that's made out of thatch, which is also a biological material. And uh, her grandfather's house is made of both the earth and both the roof and the walls is made out of the earth itself, and that you yourself come from uh, your own biology comes from a place uh, where your family resided in buildings made out of biological materials and geological materials. And while that's not rare for anyone on the planet, I think it's very particular to uh, your own becoming and. I don't know, mm -hmm. could you do, you, do you see that connection really clearly? Do you feel that connection? Have, have you, did you think about that in your presentation? <laughs> yeah, um, I, you know, I don't think I realized that very early on. That's why I was working with this material. I think it took many, like quite a few years when I was like, really saw this connection with, uh, I didn't even know about the, the house in Ireland for a while and then going and being more in, in Socorro and Lopezville and seeing the houses over there and seeing how much I had already progressed in the practice that I was already doing um, and how much it was very related. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, th I think that's such a beautiful part of your presentation that, that you, you come from these spaces uh, that are contributing to the way you continue to work and you're, you're just maintaining traditions in really wonderful ways, especially uh, that you're perpetuating the traditions in, in a time that those traditions are coming to an end. I, I mentioned that one half of the population lives, works uh, in buildings made out of earth. And since then, concrete has taken over the planet. Um, and so I wonder if you can tell us a little bit about your, I mean, you, you didn't mention that activism is part of your work necessarily, but it, it seems that it is definitely part of it because you've told how you've taught over 100, nearly 100 people mm -hmm. uh, a tradition that I would say is dying. Mm -hmm. And you have learned that from people who have learned that from other generations. And, uh, yeah. yeah, actually I think something that's interesting, um, I don't know if this goes back. Mm -hmm. Thinking about um, even the Santa Fe style that, that's here, um, 
most of it is wood frame and then just stucco. And so it's sort of, it's like a simulation or trying to like, it's trying to imitate Adobe architecture. But um, really Adobe architecture isn't just this aesthetic, right? It's actually this relationship to land. It's relationship to having many hands and community and family that comes together to even maintain it, right? But then with Santa Fe style, it's like, it's missing all of that. Right, it's made out of like plastic, and I mean, what is what is stucco? I mean, in some cases, it's latex. Yeah, and, you know. yeah, and so it's interesting to think like how far it's come to just literally be a like this this imitation to something, and then how the actual heart of the material isn't even there. I mean, I, I think you point out something that's really important, which is there there is a generational loss of tradition in the region, and it's not only a generational, generational loss of a building technology, but also in many cases of, of language and food traditions and other kinds of customs. Mm -hmm. And I, I think what's really spe not, not, not only special and interesting and about your work, but important about your work is that you are, you are continuing and maintaining those traditions and I'm struck by the titles of your last two exhibitions, one in which you call a laboratory and one which you call a theater. Uh, and when I think about the theater, I think that there are theaters, theater performances that are tragedies uh, and romance mm -hmm. and comedies. Um, and I think about the laboratory as a place of discovery. And I think what's so special about your work is that you are both rediscovering a knowledge base and celebrating it within all of the possibilities of that theater. And, and so I just wanted to congratulate you on this amazing work. And so thank you, Joanna. Thank you, Ronald. <laughs> thank you.